Raghu, in yeah. today's scenario, yeah. what is the relevance of organic food? Yeah, yeah. See, uh, whether you call it as organic, there are different names to organic. Uh, you know, the organic, biodynamic, permaculture, sahaja krishi, natural agriculture. All lot of names under various, uh, you know, uh, name categories. It is being uh, practiced. But you ask me whether what is the relevance of organic? Why are we talking today the relevance of organic? We know today that there are large scale problems with current agricultural practices. They, everybody knows that they simply cannot sustain, that we cannot live with toxic residues both into our body, out there in the rivers and oceans. And uh, the large scale input uh, that agriculture today consumes. Take for example, no, if I have to say the relevance of organic or natural farming or more eco-friendly farming, uh, then we should know what is the problem with the current system. The current system today we have is take for example energy. Now, in order to get one calorie, we are talk today talking about consuming, spending 10 calorie to produce one calorie of food. If you take a frozen green piece, they talk something like 15 calorie to deliver one calorie. This is unsustainable system. And uh, you say, for example, it's, this, it's, it's like uh, uh, burning the house to get rid of a mouse. <laughs> uh, you know, it just cannot sustain. You cannot be spending, you got it. We know the second law of thermodynamics that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Okay, but it can, it can be, uh, but at the same time, you can convert this one good form into another bad form. That's the problem. So whether the current system is sustainable is a serious, serious question. Take for example shrimp. Today to produce one kg of shrimp and to export it to United States of America, we have to feed four kg of sea fish. Is that the way to do it? Should you be, you know, why not eat the sea fish itself? Why produce uh, this uh, exotic variety and sell it to uh, the United States of America on foreign exchange at the cost, at the capital cost of natural resources? And then you see, in our production system today, we have large number of pesticides, large number of fungicides, okay, and uh, uh, herbicides. So large number of them, you know, in order to produce this food, we have, you know, we have to dump large quantity of chemicals. Does it really help? Does it really? Today, if you talk about India, we are almost using 20,000 crore worth of pesticides. And half of it is exported. Of course, their people use also pesticides within the household. But the system is riddled with all these toxics. Take, for example, antibiotics. Why are antibiotics produced? Antibiotics are not supposed to be given for weight gain, you know, meat production. They are supposed to be used for treating diseases. But today we have, they say you have antibiotic resistant genes even in Antarctica. See, when you use antibiotic in the animal farming, in the current system, so what happens, you, 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 okay, you get the residues of it in the meat, milk and egg and all that. But then its waste goes as manure to farm, to grow fruits and vegetables. So you have problem of antibiotic resistance going across and bacteria, they are very clever. They also transfer their antibiotic resistance gene horizontally across other, other, other microbes. So you have a serious problem of anti antibiotic resistant genes emerging uh, across the world. So I would say that uh, today organic holds water and is relevant because in organic you have to do polyculture, you can't do monoculture. There may be a wrong kind of organic agriculture in the polyhouses and all kinds of things. Not that you shouldn't do it in the polyhouse, but organic is embedded in polyculture. Organic means that you will have to bring back the number of the sturdy and hardy variety of seeds and breeds that have gone into the oblivion. Bring them back into the system. They have their natural immunity. Some of them can grow without seed. Take for example a hybrid cow and a native breeds of cow. I mean, what kind of input you need for the hybrid varieties where yield alone is the criteria. Look at the natural, you see typically they talk about the natural farming in the chicken farming. In the rural countryside, chicken farming is you use a chicken, sorry the kitchen waste and feed the chicken and get the chicken back into the kitchen. That's a natural farming, that's a sustainable system. You don't build a house, a concrete house for the chicken and feed the corn and soya grown in the Amazon forest. So how do you do chicken farming?
you know, it just defeats the common sense that animal farming, if you take animal farming, was always a part and parcel of the human farming. They were complementing each other. You get the grain, grass goes to animals. Today, you grow the grain for animals and the leftover oil comes to human beings. So today, the byproducts of animal feeding comes to human beings. So this is not, you know, sustainable. This is not very healthy. Today, we talk about global warming. Today, we talk about uh, ecological damage. We talk about sixth mass extinction. We talk about uh, islands of dead, uh, dead oceans in the, in, the, in, the, in the ocean. Dead oceans is where nothing grows because uh, too much of nitrates from the agri-fertilizers uh, leaching into the ocean and then uh, algal growth and then there is no oxygen available. So the fishes die. The marine life, you know, is at uh, great, uh, it's a threat to marine life. So you have, you know, it's not, farming is not within the four walls. It's done in the open environment. It is done in the open ecology. And what kind of impact it has? As, as sensible human beings, we know that we share this world with other beings. And the catalogued species on this earth are just about 10 million. But they say uncatalogued could be 100 million. That is why it is said that we need to preserve this world in whatever you do, particularly agriculture, because it is done in the open environment, so that you preserve the nature, so one day you will start appreciating how ignorant fools we were. But Raghu, they say that organic food is very expensive, yeah. which middle class can't afford. Yeah. Like, what do yeah. you have to yeah. say yeah. about this? But you see, in my opinion, they always ask this question, counter question, what is the real cost of cheap food? If you consume large quantities of sugars and fat and the refined foods that we all consume and we end up spending our money for the diabetes and sugar and, and um, heart health. Today, you know, WHO says that once diabetic strikes at the age of 40, it costs you 10 lakh rupees. So are you, so it is very good, but uh, you do because it, it feeds the economy and all that pharmaceutical companies grow, hospitals grow and all that. So what is the cost of the real food? If you had to eat healthy food, I know, you see, unfortunately, organic today is expensive, almost 30% more. Uh, but I would say, if you account saving water, preserving ecology, insect population, or the microbial population, if your production system has not eliminated and decimated those systems and you have produced a cheap food, then you will ask further questions. This, the typically current practice is produce heap and sell cheap. You know, that's the kind of agriculture production system we have. But what is the real cost of a food? If you produce nutritious food, if you provide biodiverse food, if you have varieties of food, if it is, production is slightly less, then you, if you pay more because you have saved water, because you see, for cleaning environment, how much are we spending today? See, the government of India last year sanctioned 3,000 crore to clean pesticide in river waters. Is that the way? Can we clean up the air, water, soil? Can you clean up all that? We cannot clean up. Because this is a very dynamic, emerging ecosystem. You cannot clean it up. But you must eliminate. How can you prevent? So in my opinion, see, organic farming is a, is a thought-intensive science. In chemical farming, in my opinion, you have a narrow construct of cause and effect. You have a pest problem, use the pesticide. You have a soil problem, you use a fertilizer. You use a problem, use this. You are not getting sleep, take a sleeping tablet. So this is a kind of a problem and solution con you know, uh, kind of a match. But I find problem with that match. So I, I, I would say that the organic farming can definitely feed the world if you follow the nutrition per acre and you know, maintain the ecology, environment and all that. All said and done. Today, we produce something like 2,600 billion tons of food, which, if you calculate, is more than enough to be, feed 7 billion people. Why are hung, one, 1 billion people, 100 crore people, are hungry and malnourished? Why are 125 crore people are overfed and obese? So, it is not the production that the pro we have problem with, but the distribution, but the diversity and all that. And all said and done, today you take for example, government across the world, they subsidize chemical farming. If you put poison, you are subsidized. If you don't put, you save the nature and give you a healthy food, there is no incentive. 
And people ask, why is it more costly? People don't understand the hidden cost of food production. Do you know there is one connection? Many well-known people are saying that when you subsidize wrong food, you end up being obese. You don't see the link. Apparently, you don't see the link. But let's say I subsidize urea and I subsidize one single variety of rice. I subsidize processing. I give you white rice and you eat it and you become sick. So I'm saying and then I subsidize the hospital care. I subsidize insurance. Look at the economy. We run our own diseases. Should we not think of, you know, how to how to be preventive in diseases, how to be proactive? So there is enough food. And food can be, take for example India, which is 60% is dry land. You can't use fertilizers, pesticide in dry land. But India has forgotten dry land. And we import 60,000 crore worth of oil from uh, you know, South America and Malaysia. Oh. It's a massive quantity of oil. We don't grow oil seeds in this country. And if we can tackle the dry land farming, which is possible to do organically, you know, the eco-diverse, you know, ecologically fragile regions. So I, you see, if you, see, what we have done is, in the current economic system, we exclude ecology and social cost. They say, what is the cost of pollination by bees? The FAO says about $300 billion. That's the cost of pollination. But we don't account for it. That is why you always miss the wood for trees. People ask, that, that is why it is sad, that you know, people, we have great answers, but for, unfortunately for wrong questions in our production uh, you know, system today. So Raghu, now tell me how difficult is it in India to do organic farming? Is it easy or is it very difficult right now at this situation? I would say see, there are a lot of community knowledge when it comes to human health, when it comes to agriculture, when it comes to animal husbandry. How do Todas, you know, the tribes in Nilgiris, take care of buffaloes? There's no veterinary doctor there. Do they not have, do, don't they know how to take care of animal health? They know. I have a book called Wild Health by Cindy. She struggles. How do animals take care of their health? So I'm not saying, you know, you don't want science and, uh, and technology. But you also see that something is working already. Something is already working. You see the natural farming and, you know, without, see, if I can grow food in a complementary way, you see, typically it is like this. Why does a pest emerge when there is monoculture, when there is water logging, when I have used, when soil fertility is connected to pest emergence? Suppose I have a beautiful milieu of microbe in the soil and a good humus in the soil, higher carbon content in the soil, then the pest emergence is very less. So the deeper connection in nature, see, don't have a narrow construct, deeper connection in nature, then you say the pest is not because the by pest itself, but because you provided a conducive environment for the pest to emerge. And first to become more potent, you use pesticides and more pesticides and they become more potent, then you had to genetically modify food in order to resist the uh, pest. So it is quite, typically, you know, it is said that it is a treadmill technology where, you know, you, you keep moving, but you don't move at all. It's like a sea waves. They move, but they don't move away. Uh, they are there, but you, are, you always make to, make to feel that it is progress is happening, development is happening. But all said and done, I don't want to eat food riddled, riddled with uh, poisons and you know pesticides and antibiotics. I want to eat a healthy food. I don't want to subject myself. I'm not a guinea pig. I want to be healthy. I want to be happy. I want to eat natural food. I want to eat a diverse variety of food. So that is what I think, you, whether you call it organic, biodynamic and all. I think the science, see, ecology was never considered as a science, unfortunately. Even Evo Wilson, the man who popularized, you know, the ecological concept in the, in, the, in the Harvard, his department was shut down. Where they simply said, this is not science. Science is show me. You produce something. You give me A plus B is equal to C plus D. Do you show me something. But in ecology, you can't show like that. There are complex connections. So that is why in order to preserve ecology and, you know, diversity, health, and without all these toxic residues that come to us, uh, and that's a threat to other beings also, so that is where I feel, you give any name to organic, you give biodynamic, any name you call it. But it is high time we thought that can our food be safe? See, they say the current world rewards around three things. Insecurity, uncertainty and unsafety. What uh, Zygmunt Bauman, a renowned sociologist calls as the trinity of the modern world. Trinity of the modern world is unsafety, insecurity and uncertainty. 
That's the problem. And in the production system, he also says that we create waste. And one of the waste is human beings themselves. There are waste products out of the economic system. So I think we need to go back to eco-technology, sustainable farming, less input. Take for example urea. Today, in the beginning, we gave 1 kg of urea for 25 kg of food grain. Today, 1 kg of urea, urea yields only 7 kg of grain. Imagine 30 million tons of urea, urea for 250 million tons of food grain. And it is, you see, you see the ratio is declining year by year. I think you will land up using uh, 1 kg of fertilizer for half kg of grain. Is that sustainable? Serious question. Oh, I must also tell you that the phosphorus, for example, that we make DAP and phosphorus compounds to feed the agriculture, the phosphorus is mined. And uh, Nature and many of the best science journals, peer review journals, say that at the current rate of phosphorus mining, it would last about 100, 125 years. And you don't want the agriculture to continue after that? What do you do if you exhaust your mines? Is there no other way we can grow food? So the input dependent, intensive input dependent, uh, you know, technological fixes do not help us in the long run. We need science, you need deeper science, larger science to understand all this, understand the human nutrition requirement, biodiversity requirement, ecological requirement and evolve farming. Today, for example, Wes Jackson, a brilliant guy in, in the US, the Land Institute, he talks about perennial crops. You need not even plow every day, every year and plant and replant and transplant and all that. Can we have perennial uh, agriculture without the inputs? I mean, that's something seriously we should. But of course, when you, when you do something, when you do an agriculture without the input, it doesn't help the pharmaceutical industry, it doesn't help the chemical industry, it doesn't help the government, it doesn't help the subsidy, it doesn't help anybody. So, Raghu, one last question. Yes. How healthy, healthy is organic food? See, if you ask how healthy, I should ask you is if you think that the little bit of pesticide and uh, antibiotics are okay, then it is not so healthy. Uh, if you think that um, you know more nutrients and phytochemicals, anti antioxidants uh, uh, are not all that important, then it's no difference. There is no difference. So you see where you should look at this. See, if you look, if you do the comparison based on this narrow nutrition concept of carbohydrate, protein, fat, and all that. You, will not, you may not see much difference. But if you look at the amino acids, if you look at the phytonutrient profile, if you look at the harm the pesticides and antibiotic residues can do to your human health, you see a world of difference. But you see, the problem is, see, Matt Ridley, who wrote this famous book called Rational Optimist, where he says that in the high yield era, we have produced large quantity of starch, which is sugary, which he says that there is more amylopectin and less of amylose which means that it floods your blood quickly. What you eat floods your blood quickly and you don't spend the energy, it lands up being uh, stored as fat. So there is a serious problem. If you see the, the very production system, you, you, the agriculture scientists are disconnected from nutritional aspect. Nutritional scientists are disconnected from something else. There is always a disconnect. But if you see the, to, to see the real value, you should be able to connect this way that when I give, see, we all have to derive 60% of starch for our energy because the blood and brain uses only uh, starch as a, uh, as a energy source. But what kind of a starch? Are you eating high yield, in, you know, this sugary starch or complex starch, starch? Then you see the difference. A cow that walks a lot and eats diversity of uh, plants, you will have better nutrition in the milk. You will have higher omega-3 fatty acid than a cow that is always tied to its shed and you know just change from one shed to another shed. You will see a difference in the milk, milk quality. So I would say that there are the, the difference that you will have to see, uh, you know, if you really see, that's why, that's why you know, Oscar Wilde's famous statement that we today, the modern age, knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. So you will have to discriminate uh, this way, then you see the real change. Uh, as I said, you know, that there are a large number of unknown compounds. Unknown compounds. Don't take the current yardstick and judge and decide. You know, that's why I say, see, we have one lakh variety of rice. But if you see the nutritive value of Indian foods or the nutrition table of the US FDA and many of the FAO uh, tables, you, give, you get one table for rice. Are they all same? No, they are not same. You have different varieties of rice. Different, they, they speak in different colors, size, shape. 
yield, whole lot of difference you see. But nutritionally they are same. How can they be same? That's why, you know, Rumi, the great Sufi saint said, if you call me a Shia, Sunni, Hindu, Muslim, Christian, and put me, put me into any box, that will be your coffin. Yeah, so you must be able, to, it's not that, you know, you, it's, it's not that the, that the world changes, but you need to develop a new eye to see this. Because our current uh, scientific eye with which we see, there is a flaw in it. There's a fundamental flaw in it. Because you simply look at the protein, fat, and all that. You don't care what kind of starch. You don't care whether it is sugary. You don't care whether there are phytochemicals, whether there are antioxidant. Forget this is a good part of it, the nutrition part of it. What about the bad part of it? Bad part of it, am I okay with antibiotic residue? Am I okay with pesticide residue? Am I okay with growth hormones in the animal farming and the agriculture farming? Am I okay with early flowering chemicals? Am I okay with artificial ripeners? Am I okay with all that? I want my fruit to be natural and good so that I really enjoy my food.